Hello, and welcome to Heilman and Haver, the stage and screen podcast, episode 20, coming to you virtually from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios in beautiful Port Orchard, Washington. I'm Matt Haver. And I'm Greg Heilman. We're two local actors looking to hone our craft by exploring the best in local theater and on the big screen. Each week, we bring you entertainment news and views, celebrate classic Hollywood, enjoy cocktails with a Tinseltown twist, interview talented local actors and directors, and chat with industry experts from L.A. to the U.K. In a few moments, we'll be joined by Jody Rothfield, director of casting and lead talent searches for such well-known films as Sleepless in Seattle, The Ring, Life or Something Like It, Signs, and Hearts in Atlantis, starring the one and only Anthony Hopkins, who incidentally was just nominated for a Best Actor Oscar for The Father. The story of a man who refuses all assistance from his daughter as he ages and as he tries to make sense of his changing circumstances begins to doubt his loved ones, his own mind, and even the fabric of reality. The New York Times says Hopkins gives a scalding performance and the father is playing now at the historic Roxy Theater in Bremerton. Visit Faraway Entertainment for showtimes at the Roxy and to buy tickets and make sure to stay tuned right here to Heilman and Haver as we keep you updated on the Oscar race with film critic Matthew Turner and Turner Classic Movies author and commentator Jeremy Arnold coming up in April. We're pleased to be joined today by Seattle casting director and educator Jody Rothfield. Originally from New York, Jody attended Smith College and graduated from UC Berkeley with a Bachelor of Science degree in African American Studies. Her professional career began as a music producer and manager handling New York City's top session players and rock bands. Her bands played at the notorious New York City rock houses, CBGBs, Tracks, and Great Gildersleeves, opening for such acts as Talking Heads, Blondie, and Guns N' Roses. Jody also worked as a producer for several music houses, producing scores and jingles for films, television, and radio. Her casting career began in Los Angeles in 1987 under the tutelage of Ronnie Yeskel and Gary Zuckerbrod. Jody moved to Seattle in 1989 to be with her husband, a native of Washington State, and is now a 32-year veteran of casting for film like Grassroots, Sleepless in Seattle, The Ring, Smoke Signals, Life or Something Like It, and American Heart. TV, The Fugitive, Citizen Baines, Under One Roof, and lead actor searches for features including The Spiderwick Chronicles, Speed Racer, Signs, Hearts in Atlanta, Stepmom, and Great Expectations, and many, many more. Jody is also an adjunct instructor at Cornish College of the Arts and the Professional Actors Training Program at University of Washington. Jody loves actors and is a devoted local theater goer. Jody, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. So as we mentioned in your bio, you started out uh, back east in New York City in the music industry. Can you tell us a little bit about how you first transitioned into casting and how your skills from your music management and production days helped launch your current career? Well, actually, they're totally separate. When I was in New York, I was a music manager and producer. So my bands opened for, this tells you how old I am, for like Talking Heads at, and CBG, at CBGBs and all the, the hip clubs of those days. Uh, my bands were the opening acts. And what I did was I, I worked a lot with session players who are the professional musicians who are hired to play in other people's programs and albums. And then they all, want to have their, they all wanted to have their own albums. So I would shop their tape their tapes. And uh, then a lot of bands, local bands heard about me. And so I would shop them to get production deals, to get them in the studio, to do demos, which then led to record deals and stuff like that. I moved to LA just, I had kind of reached, reached the pinnacle of my career in New York. And my friend, Ronnie Yeskel, who is a casting director for um, Broadway and off Broadway, she also wanted to leave New York and maybe see what she could do in film. And I just thought I'd do music in LA. I didn't realize there would be such a big jump. It was such a big jump. I just thought, oh, I'll just keep going. And when I got there, unfortunately, I got a lot of meetings with people, but I couldn't break in. I couldn't even do something on the same level of what I had been doing in New York. And Ronnie needed an assistant. So I just helped her out. We were single and there were actors and <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> one one thing leads things. to another. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I never thought that it would be my career. I thought I would end up in music again. Well, one of the things we like to focus on on our show is kind of the behind the scenes things. We've had some actors and directors and and other folks at that level but we like also to focus on some of the behind the scenes things so we have listeners who are might be interested in in learning about what it takes to become a casting director or just get involved in the casting process so if someone was to do that or be interested in that where would they start are there schools programs how would how would someone go about getting started so casting is not something you can go to school for. There are a lot of actors who become casting directors. As a matter of fact, a good part of the casting directors that you meet in Los Angeles and New York and bigger markets were actors. I, I don't come from that background. But now in LA, the CSA 
of which uh, I belong to the CSA, it's the Casting Society of America, now has a program where they train prospective um, interns and assistants. So they tell you and teach you exactly what you need to know. And so a lot of the LA casting directors and New York, the bigger casting directors who have full-time assistants and interns, because in California, for instance, you can't, an internship is paid, which is cool. You know, they have to be paid. So you go through that program. I don't know if it costs money or not, but I don't think it does, but I could be wrong. And so you go to that program and then when the CSA members are looking for assistants or interns, they can put it, an advertisement up on the website. And so I would say that if this is something you really wanna do, the place to do it is in fact, LA or New York, and that the CSA program definitely is alive and well. Uh, the internship and assistant program is alive and well in LA. And that would be fabulous because it's a direct hit because there are thousands of, literally thousands of casting directors. And it's a very, um, it's a very fluid thing. And sometimes they are hired by a studio and the studio gives them their assistance. But most of the time, most casting directors, I think, still are independents. And so they're always looking for personnel. And if they're working on multiple projects, they usually have more than one. So it's a great way to get, so find out about the CSA program. So you were casting director for the 1993 romantic comedy, Sleepless in Seattle. Uh, we know it well, so well up here. It put Seattle on the map in many ways, uh, much like Frasier did and Grey's Anatomy uh, on the on television side. Here. What's that? They weren't filmed here. Those were externals. So in other words, a casting director like me, I'm what they call a local hire. They already have most of the stars are attached. That doesn't mean that local talent can't become principal. I only cast for principals. I don't cast for extras, but they're usually secondary roles. So they're co-stars or below. The stars are usually already attached by the time they're filming. So it's only if something's coming here that they would hire a local casting director like myself to find, to fill in all the roles. Again, no extras. These are all speaking parts. So sleep, I, I think I started Sleepless in Seattle my second week as Jody Rothfield casting. Wow. Yeah. Right. Thrown right to the wolves. Right. Well, that was <laughs> fun. I mean, Nora Ephron was brilliant, but she was, she was a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> she was hard. And the interesting thing about Sleepless in Seattle is that they cast many of the roles that now, when you watch the film, are, are um, represented by pretty well-known actors like Rob Reiner and Tom Hanks' wife and a lot of people that were friends of Nora's or friends of people who are involved with the production. So even though I cast for those roles and those people were hired, they were ultimately not used and cameos were made by people who were friends of the director which happens sometimes, but never like that. It does. I was going to say, does that happen frequently? Not like that. That was a big time, big production with two big stars and people love Nora and they wanted to be in on something she was doing. So she had, she had access to everyone, but I don't think she knew that they were interested until things started to percolate. And then unfortunately for the actors here, a lot of them who were cast in it, they didn't ever get seen, but there were several actors who in fact did stay in the movie. And, uh, so that worked out. I, I get paid whether they use people or not. So, okay. But I like to see my community represented. Obviously, if I bring someone in, that's a, that shows my taste. And if they get the role, that's good for everyone, right? So, so that was a little disappointing, but it was exciting to work on that. And we chatted a little bit off air about the fact that you draw from a talent pool, not only in Seattle, but also in Portland, or what we can kind of consider our sister city. Uh, how did that come about? You said that there's quite a, quite a talent pool down there and there's some incentives for actors in Portland. Oregon has a much better incentive plan than Washington state does, which means when people choose to film there, they get money back, they get deals. It's just a healthier financial. It's all about finances, you know, with movies. Um, they, they get a, high, a, a healthier financial return. So they're motivated to go there. Seattle has a bigger talent pool, but because Portland draws so many more projects than Seattle does because of that incentive, the people there, the actors there are auditioning all the time for big things. So they become really good auditioners. Auditioning is a skill, it's not a talent. So you get to be a good auditioner, you do well, you do better, right? So it isn't that there are better actors there, it's just they're going out for more and more things, more stuff's happening there. They draw from the Seattle talent also. So people are always going up and down there, not so much anymore now, it's all self tape but they used to go down there all the time to audition because they were bigger projects, most and union projects, which is important. So are we seeing that in, in cities like Atlanta as well? Because Georgia has a number of tax incentives for projects. So everything's being filmed there. So kind of like you said, the money, right? I guess it follows the money if there's all the money. And then once there's money, so once they build an infrastructure and the infrastructure are, you know, crew members, casting directors, actors, studios, recording spaces, they have everything in place. And then it makes sense to go 
first of all, for the incentive, because it's, it's a good money, it's a good money decision to go to a hub like that. And then people, I know a lot of actors that I've trained at UW or um, at Cornish go right to Atlanta because they know so many productions are happening there. So they want to be someplace, not LA. Some of them just are adverse to LA or just don't feel that they can make it in LA. And they go to Atlanta and it's a safer kind of a very busy hub. So I'd say that Atlanta has definitely taken the rug out to some degree from Seattle. Yet another place that has a good incentive. <laughs> <laughs> is there an average day in the life of a casting director? If so, what, what, what does that kind of day look like? Okay, well, first of all, there has to be a project in play and they have what we call live action, which means humans, okay? And in order to be able to see as many humans as possible, they hire someone who has knowledge of the talent pool. So I'm basically hired for my knowledge of the Northwest talent pool. And then my taste. So it's not just knowing who to call in based on what the specs are from my director and producers, but also who am I going to leave on tape? Who am I actually going to pick? I pick through. My only power is who gets seen. So I have to know who there is. I have to either audition them in person, or I have to know that they're not great not as strong as, as other actors. So it's my knowledge of the talent pool, which I have. And I meet people all the time between teaching and just auditioning from all over. And then my taste, who's going to end up on the tape for them to look at, to pick from. And boy, I bet things have probably changed with COVID. You're talking about meeting people in person and things like that. What, what sort of challenges have you run into with, with the quarantine and with COVID? Well, first of all, from the middle of March until the beginning of August, there was no work at all. There was work. I know Microsoft continued to do work. I don't know how they did that with COVID and what the specifications were from the state. But in terms of my world, we had to give up our studio because people weren't coming in person. So that's the physicality of it. And also my joy is the actual interaction with the actors in person, because even if I do a Zoom audition with people, which is what I do now, it isn't the same. It just isn't the same to have them in the room. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't play as well. It doesn't play as as uniquely as it does when it's in person. So as of August, we've been going gangbusters, which is great, but everything is on Zoom. So first round can either be on Zoom where I get to direct the actors and I can see fewer people that way, or I just tell them what I want, which is what I'm being told that my client wants, and they do self-tapes. And then I pour through the self-tapes, decide which ones I'm going to show, and then my client decides who they want to have a callback with, and the callback's always Zoom. So that's changed the whole thing, you know? Oh, we understand that. <laughs> oh, for sure. So when you direct uh, an actor during an audition, do you direct them specifically for the project that you're casting for, or is there just a general set of guidelines you're looking for? For the project that I'm casting for. Every project has, has a different rhythm and has a different, a unique presentation. So that's why you want a casting director and you don't want to leave the actors up to their own devices because the, the more information you give an actor, the better their performance is going to be because they rely on some sort of guidelines. And I can write out guidelines, but it's not the same as, as my saying, no, let's do that again and let's start from this. And the whole point of a casting director with the reason why we have director at the end of our names and we're not casting agents, there's no such thing as a casting agent, um, it's because we direct. So when the actual director is not in the room, we are the person, the point person to give the director who's already had a conversation with a casting director, what we think that they have asked for to, to, to move the, the performance in a way that will appeal to what the director is looking for. That's the job of a casting director once we're in the room with an actor. Well, that brings us to research. I, you, you spoke to that a little bit already. Uh, a lot of the information comes directly from the director and producer. What kind of research do you do when you're casting for a specific part or project? Do you do they send you the screenplay? Do you read the book if there was one? Watch theatrical versions, things like that. And I mean, for example, have you ever sat down with an original author uh, and gotten their vision for the characters? I've, I've worked on a few projects where I actually have worked with the author, but generally by the time a, a film is being made, there is an intermediary. There's the piece that the author has written, and sometimes the director is, you know, it has a very good relationship with the writer, and they they work out what what they hope that the film will encompass. But generally, I'm working with the director. Now, in LA, when you work on a film, you get together with with the director, and then you make a list of people you feel would be appropriate based on information given to you by the director and present before you even get the job as the casting director, which is kind of unfair. Here we don't generally, because we do supporting roles and, and some leads, but we read, uh, I'm given a whole script and that changes daily, by the way, the sides change for actors daily. Parts are taken out, new parts are put in, parts evolve uh, almost sometimes unrecognizably, age-wise, gender-wise, ethnicity-wise. But essentially, when I'm directing an actor, I am the spokesperson for the, who's, the person whose vision 
the piece is. So that's generally the director. And the director works it out with the writer, if that's their deal, to get the writer's uh, influence on what they're looking for. But sometimes the piece that ends up being shot doesn't resemble the, the original screenplay that much. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's the fluid nature of filming, of film. I assume that has to be part of some of the excitement of the job, too, is you just kind of never know what each day is going to bring. It's true. It's very exciting. And I'll tell you what's even more exciting. You know, people always say, God, you're seeing 60 people for one role. By the 40th, are you ready to pull your hair out of your head? <laughs> and generally, you'd think that that would be true. But the, but the, my truth is that none of the people who come in with the same information and the same sides, which means their lines, their, their particular script for their role, do give me the same performance because that's what's so beautiful about acting is that it, it, there is a certain amount of your own truth that you bring to the table, your interpretation of things, even with the same information and the same script being generated to you as the other 50, you know? And so it's very fast. It's really fascinating. I've even had actors who've been readers for me say, oh my God, this is the best education I could possibly get being in the room with my colleagues and seeing just how very different they are. And we call it, you know, what they come in with is what they bring to the table and what they what it morphs into is based on direction and, and where we take them. So it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've talked about the, the vision of authors and directors, and I've always wondered, you see an interview with a director and or, or an uh, author, the screenwriter, where they have already envisioned who should be in a particular role. And you kind of implied a little bit of this with Sleepless in Seattle. But in, in those instances, I've, I've wondered, well, if they're already picking these people out, you know, what, what's the role of the casting director at that point? If you could speak to that, but I also want to know if that's kind of the minority or the uh, rarity. In most cases, are you just given the vision and you and you go find who would be best for a particular role? You know, when people hire me who, if they're shooting in Seattle that's or the Northwest, that's why they would hire me, right? They have people in LA that give out offers to the New York actors and people who are going to star or have names. They don't, sometimes they don't even meet with them. It's all done through legal. When they're coming to, to do a local hire, which means they're outside of the big talent pools, they're looking to see who there is. They don't know. Now, I've had casting directors start by saying me, to me, throw the net wide, meaning I don't know what your taste is, so I just want to see everybody, okay? Don't take it upon yourself to decide who I should or should not see. Me and the casting director who's casting the, the names, all right? I'm usually a secondary casting director, which means there's the main casting director and then there's the location casting director. And remember, we don't do extras, so these are still speaking roles, and some of them are huge, and some people end up being leads, believe it or not. So, but once they know your taste and you send that first round of casting tapes to them, they can see if they appreciate your direction with the actors, if they like the actors that you're bringing in. And then they start to say, okay, don't make the net so wide. Don't throw it so wide. Pick who you like. We trust your taste and we trust your ability to get a performance from them once, we get, once you get them in the room, which is everything for a casting director. When I get you in the room, it doesn't matter what you've done previously or what your reel shows me. What I can get from you in the room is really what I want to see because it's for this particular project with the words of this particular project with, you know, the, the feeling of this particular project. And that's what they want to see. It's not general anymore. It's very specific to the project at hand. Does that then lead to uh, that, that trust you build a relationship where they'll come back to you because you've provided. The, Always. The kind of, yeah. They trust me. They know they're not going to have to see the world because they trust me to pick through, to find the gems, and then they can pick through the gems instead of seeing everybody and their mother, which is not fun for them. It's very time. Casting is very tedious for people who don't do casting. They really just want to see the gems and pick from the gems. That's it. I'm supposed to see everyone and decide who the gems are. And already by the time I'm casting, I've already picked out Pretty much when I get a project, I'm already thinking about who I'm going to invite in. And then it's the job of the agents to, sh to try to get me to see people that I have not asked for or that they feel I don't really get so that I can, I can entertain possibility of using that or showing them. Um, but I already know when I, have a, when I have a job, like who I'm going to bring in, who I know that I think would be right for it. And then it's, I want to show other people as well and people that I don't know because I might be missing someone who's amazing. And that's the job of the agent to make sure that I see those people. So I rely on the agents for that stuff. It's very important. The agents are very important. So how much of your business is return business? And it sounds like it's so much relationship based. Uh, do, you, do you end up working with the same directors frequently? I do because they trust me and they know me and uh, they walk away feeling like they got to see people they hadn't seen before or they, they got they definitely feel like they're two or three deep in each 
in each role that they have choices because they usually have to have other people sign off on the choices too. I get a lot of repeat people, but I also get a lot of new people because people still like to shoot, thank God, in Seattle. So they may not be familiar with Seattle, Seattle talent. And they want to know, they ask the agents and some of them have other contacts in the production end of it. And they say, you know, who do you work with a lot? Who would you recommend? And might be one or two names. When you're uh, running auditions, what do you find is more important when casting for a role, uh, especially a lead role, uh, that the actor actress resembles the character physically or that they're capable of bringing that character's personality and behavior to life as described by the director, the screenplay, or, or envisioned by the by the creatives, uh, the vision they've given you? Um, I mean, it's both because obviously they say we want a, a young woman who's an ingenue, blonde, five foot six, blah, 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 boom. I mean, I'm given that's that's a pretty small group in Seattle, but I always expand and always show them the best actors because my philosophy is the best actor will always win. So even if they don't necessarily resemble in total the, the fantasy of the director, they have a better shot of getting it when they bring in the they bring that the quality of that character in the room. So it's 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 a balancing act because you would not show someone who's totally well. You could I mean sometimes I find myself creative casting and throwing someone in that wouldn't normally fit the description that I'm given for that particular role just because I think they're such an interesting choice. And about four out of ten times the director will say, "Yeah, this is a very interesting choice," and that person will in fact, be a contender, whereas the people who more resembled their fantasy of what the character would look like, I mean, it's a visual medium. So when you're setting up characters and they have relationships, the director obviously has a fantasy of how that will play. And it's my job to make sure that that visual representation is there. But there are some places to play. And of course, that's my delight. Sure. Someone who's antithetical, you know, to what their vision is. And that person gets the job or gets to be a real contender because they're so wonderful at, at fleshing out the character and bringing the character to life. Is the director generally the one to make the final call? Has there, has there ever been a situation where you and maybe the director themselves have put someone in there that you think is just perfect and then it's been nixed <laughs> at the 11th <laughs> hour by the, by the muckety mucks? So, of course, a director is, is a very important part of the project and the director's vision is the vision that I get. But some newer directors don't have the, the backup of the producers who may be in love with an idea of a particular type of actor. And when they don't see it, even though it's a good actor, they don't realize how much that actor can bring to the project. Um, so yes, oftentimes directors, depending upon their note, their, um, if they're directors of note, they usually swing a heavier hammer, you know, in terms of who gets chosen. But if they're on the newer side or they weren't the first choice for, for a, um, a film, sometimes they have to have the powers that be. For instance, if it's a Warner Brothers or a, a big studio, this, somebody at the studio will have to sign off on the choices that the director makes. But if it's a big enough director, generally, they don't really have to get permission. But it be, it's, it's surprising sometimes because it's true. <laughs> I'll have a meeting of, a, of the minds with the director, but then some, some producer, some higher up will throw a kink in it because their vision isn't being met by it. Sometimes that throws off the whole feeling of the piece because the director is the is the visionary of the whole piece so if, if the director can incorporate this person but a producer just can't see it because most producers are money people they're accountants and lawyers they're not creatives necessarily they're not interested in actually finding something new that would be really revelatory you know they're more interested in like what they know works and that can be a real that can be a real downer for the the creativity of a piece not exactly risk takers yeah no they're not yeah, it was interesting. We, we spoke with Danny Bilson, uh, who's a screenwriter for The Rockets here, and m most recently worked with Spike Lee on The Five Bloods. And he it's, it's fascinating because there's so many different folks involved. There's so many chiefs, and they all have a different vision often about, well, many things, the setting, the characters, uh, who should play them. And so at every level, <laughs> you've got the opportunity for someone to interject some new idea. And we asked him specifically, you know, as the screenwriter in the past, you know, he's been asked to be involved in some of these decisions. And he goes, I don't want any part of it. As soon as I've handed over my baby, I step out. And I assume that there are, I mean, every director and every person you work with at every level is probably has their own, their own ideas on how involved they should be with your process specifically. 
Mm -hmm. Well, casting is, I, you can't cast a movie without actors. Actors make a movie. How many times have you gone to a movie that you've really been looking forward to? The storyline excites you, but you just can't get into the head of the actor. The character's just not happening for you. You don't walk out as fulfilled as you would be if the story isn't so great, but the character gets into your head. So casting is, I think, I hate to say this, you have to have a good story, but if it's not properly cast, it can, it, it, it just doesn't, it just lays flat. The actors flesh out a story and you have to have the right actors and that's part of a vision. And the vision is the directors. So that people wanna insert their opinions that aren't creatives because they can, it's a problem for a director. So I'm sure directors cope with that in many different ways. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> His way of coping was, you know, I'm just telling you what I'd like and you you mess with it. Right. But I think people really mess with it. And I've gone to movies and because I'm a casting director, what do I pay attention to? Sure. You know, my husband sits next to me and he worries about continuity. Oh, the clock is wrong in this scene. You know, <laughs> my thing is like, oh my God, I can't get into this actor's head. I don't care about this actor. That's either the actor's problem or it's the directing of the actor. It could be either. But generally when it's the actor, it's because somebody didn't get what they wanted. So I, I recently watched I Care A Lot, Rosamund Pike. And that's when I noticed that she in that role just owned it. I mean, every every scene she was in, the, the character. So there, I think there's an example of what you're talking about where a character can make a role even bigger than what it is on paper. And people like Diane Weiss, I mean, they had an amazing cast in that. See, casting directors are also, it's not just about the main characters. The ensemble is really important. And there are a lot of actors, now that you have People Magazine and the internet, not as many actors have anonymity, meaning you see them a lot, but you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. The casting director knows those people. They see a part and they go, oh, this is a so-and-so part. And that night, that actor may not be a household word name, but that actor brings deliciousness to a scene or to, you know, to a movie. So the whole point is to know it's well, who we know, to, to insert into certain roles. So just because they're not the main characters doesn't mean that they, they shouldn't be just as marvelous as the main characters or the main actors. You know, so that's, of course, the knowledge of a casting director to bring those people in because they're not household names, but they know they're, they're known amongst their peers and, and casting people, which is what's the most important thing. If I was an actor, that's what I'd want. You, you know, you know, that guy that, you know, that guy, I love him. He's yeah. great in everything. <laughs> right. I don't know his name. That must be really great for that actor because that actor works and has anonymity. Yep. You know, everyone knows to call that actor. I remember seeing Allison Janney say in an interview, she really hates to audition at this point. I mean, people just know, get Allison for this. She goes, I really want to know. I'm hoping that whoever's doing the casting or producing or directing just says, get Allison for this role. Because Allison's perfect for this role. And that isn't necessarily the lead, but she, she, she's part of it. She makes it whole. It's, it's not just one actor that carries a movie, unless it's a one-actor movie, which there are actors like that, and there are movies like that. But usually it's an ensemble somewhere along the line. Well, it's, it probably speaks uh, even more to, uh, again, like you said earlier, building those relationships and that every person along the line needs to think about that, that we had a, an actor from uh, Seattle on recently, Doug Fall, and he talked about that constellation of, of connections that you make and how you should never burn a bridge because you never know who's going to think of you along that supply chain, I guess, for lack of a better term. And I know Doug and I know his work. And uh, the more I see him audition for things, it's been a while since I've had something right for him. But when he comes in, I always remark to him, wow, you know, I never thought of you in this role, but I brought you in anyway, but wow, you did really well. So there I'm seeing your, you know, repertoire. I'm seeing like your range. And, and sometimes you in a commercial town, and we really pretty much at this point are more of a commercial town. Sometimes you don't see those actors a lot. The character actors are more, you know, because they're not, they're not specific specific type enough. And so you miss out on some of their amazing abilities because they don't fit that mold. But what's great about what's happening even in the commercial market now, not just film, where like people who used to be relegated to being um, character actors now can actually, you know, handle a lead like Paul Giamatti started here. Yes. You know, he was always a character actor and then people started writing things for him and he became a lead. Paul Giamatti, character actor, right? But he yeah. became a lead. So one of all the best. These other people, <laughs> right. One of the best, but who would have known, right? Um, so it's about being able to see people do different things. And that's why I go to a lot of theater too. This is a theater town, which is why there's um, anything shot here at all. We pull very much from, from the theater community. And I go to lots of theater because I see people's range. You know, I see that in theater, they're, they're much more capable of casting something it, it, with, it, with a little bit more um, creativity. And so I see people who I think of one way in a different way. And then when it's time for me to bring them in for something, I'm more open to possibly 
allowing them to show me that side of what they can do. And that's really fascinating. That's really wonderful. That's fun. Our guest is Jody Rothfield, Director of Casting and Lead Talent Searches for such well-known films as Sleepless in Seattle, The Ring, Life or Something Like It, Signs, and Hearts in Atlantis. When we come back, we'll hear more about our journey in the industry and get some casting tips for all you actors out there. So stick with us right here, Heilman and Haber. Welcome back to Heilman and Haver. Today is March 19th, the birthday of Bruce Willis, born in 1955. Willis's breakout role opposite Sybil Shepard in Moonlighting launched a career in films that have grossed in excess of $2.5 billion worldwide. After starring as smart aleck detective David Addison Jr., he quickly became a household name playing wisecracking or hard-edged characters like hard-boiled New York City detective John McClane in Die Hard, police detective John Hartigan in Sin City, and a bit of a departure, disheartened child psychologist Malcolm Crow in The Sixth Sense. Also born today in 1947, actress Glenn Close, seven-time Academy Award-nominated actress known best for her role as, let's call it, dedicated lover to Michael Douglas in 1987's Fatal Attraction, and as Jenny Fields in The World According to Garp alongside Robin Williams. A three-time Tony Award winner for her work on Broadway, Close is slated to play Norma Desmond in the remake of Billy Wilder's 1950s classic, Sunset Boulevard, now in pre-production. She does share the record for most Academy Award nominations without a win, along with Peter O'Toole. And happy 85th birthday today to Ursula Andress. In 1962, the Swiss beauty was cast as bikini-clad Honey Rider in Sean Connery's debut as 007 in Ian Fleming's Dr. No. Her appearance was somewhat brief, and her Swiss-German accent was so thick that her entire performance had to be dubbed by a voiceover artist. After starring opposite Elvis Presley in Fun in Acapulco in 1963 and Dean Martin in Four for Texas, also in 1963, Andrus appeared in Casino Royale in 1967, a satirical foray into the world of James Bond starring Peter Sellers and David Niven. And speaking of James Bond, also on this day in 1964, Sean Connery began his first day of filming on his third installment as 007 in Goldfinger, starring Gert Frobe as the gold-obsessed supervillain and Honor Blackman as Pussy Galore. Connery would eventually star in six films featuring Ian Fleming's martini-sipping super sleuth, despite Fleming originally wanting to cast David Niven for the role. And casting is the topic of the day here on Heilman and Haver, and we're pleased to be joined by Seattle-based casting director Jody Rothfield. Well, I recently watched uh, with my daughter the, the 2012 documentary Casting By uh, about the career of Marion Doherty and her work uh, as a trailblazer, not only for casting directors, but for women in the, in the business. Right. Um, she was responsible for launching so many careers and and didn't get a whole lot of credit I mean, and she was you know contributing to major films like midnight cowboy and willie wonk and the chocolate factory batman lethal weapon yeah now, there's still no oscar for casting directors boo hiss but there will be there will be casting society of america has made inroads to get awards for casting and when marion was a casting director there weren't a lot of women there were women but there weren't a lot of women she was a really casting director of note so uh, times have evolved and a lot of casting directors are women I and mean, there are plenty of men but they're mostly women I would say and um, not that that makes a difference casting is casting but so I think pretty soon we have our own award called the Ardios, which is awarded by casting directors to other casting directors my friend Ronnie who got me into casting has won uh, I think several of those at least one uh, for the sessions I think and what um, what's happening is that we're making inroads CSA is definitely making inroads for that and I think you'll see an Oscar being given out, I think, in the next three or four years. Because now uh, it's a big deal to be a casting director now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of what I got from, from that documentary is that it's, it's finally kind of being realized, the, the impact. And it goes back to something you said earlier. You can have a fantastic cast and the, poor, the story can be poor. <laughs> And there's not much you can salvage from that. Or you can have a, a you know, fantastic, magnificent story. But the casting just isn't right. And I mean, I would make the argument that casting is what really makes the makes or breaks a show. I mean, really, if, I, if I'm going to hand the obviously you need a good director, you do need the good story. But that's the place where everything can either break down or work in yeah. my in my mind. I agree. If you can get into the head of at least one character and stay with them and have, stay in their head and their perspective through the whole piece, you feel very fulfilled by the end. But if the actors are just secondary to the role, 
to the to the plot sometimes that you can't it's not as fulfilling you don't feel like you you experience something that it took you away you know sometimes it's shot beautifully the story is cool but there just isn't anything happening that pulls you in people are i mean we're human beings so we respond to the social thing you know so we respond to human beings interacting with human beings so it's so important so so actors come into different people's rooms. Sometimes they're coming directly in for producers because they don't have a budget for a casting director. We're very expensive. Sometimes they come in for a casting director. And I always tell my students, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to stay in Seattle or a town like Seattle, like Portland, for a while to get your feet wet, you'll really learn how to audition properly because we want so much for you to succeed and we get to know how you work. So I know some actors come in, I know to capture that first, that first take even though I'm probably gonna give them a second take because they're the type of actor that the first takes gold. Sometimes I have an actor that I know, hey, I need a little more warm up. They'll do great, but I have to make sure that I give them a warm up and then the second or third take is gonna be better. And so my knowledge of, the, of how they work and their knowledge that I'm gonna be an advocate for them right. really takes off in the room. And you can really see it. And people who work my camera for me and people who read for me always say the same thing. It's a totally different experience. When you have someone there to read with, to react off of because acting is listening and reacting. So it's nice to have a real human doing that. And I think it just changes the dynamic of the audition. So I think people do audition better when they're in the room with someone. Absolutely, absolutely. In our, um, in our early shows, we talked about the ramifications of the reversal of United States versus Paramount, the um, ruling that kind of broke up the studio system where you had actors that were assigned to or contracted with studios and things like that. With before the reverse, gentlemen, before my time, <laughs> it's 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 become more current because that's all been overturned uh, yeah. last August. So the potential is there for studios to own the distribution chain again, especially with streaming and things like that, and could exert start to exert some control over what actors they're associated with. Do you think if something like that happens? Uh, where actors start to get tied more towards studios and studios are, are more particular about what they want, that that could affect your work as a casting director, give you a little less freedom? Well, you know, again, don't forget the market I'm in. I'm not in Los Angeles or New York. I don't, I don't usually deal. I have to do deals with big actors sometimes, but on the whole, I'm doing supporting roles. Some people do get to be leads, but they're coming in as supporting first. All right. So I don't really have to go through that. I'm already on a different tier where certain things have been set in stone and then I just run with that. It's not the same dynamic as it is in a bigger market where the casting directors are dealing with actually pulling in big names. And then there might be some issue there, you know, associated with another film. My actors in general are the supporting actors. So there really isn't that, that's, that's not really a big deal for me. I don't, I don't see it as becoming a big deal that way. Are there less politics at this level than at, than at that level where you're looking at, you know, the super leads and, and that kind of stuff? I'm sure, I'm sure. But I've had uh, unfortunate situations where I've been in a room where producers are in like the final, final, you know, in, in film, most, not in commercials, but for film, you might have several callbacks, all right? And I'll hear a comment like, well, I don't believe he would really sleep with her from somebody who's not even involved in the choice you know what I mean like of course as a woman I'm not even talking about as from a woman's perspective hearing that and feeling very defensive and of offended I'm talking about just here's this person like in the, in, the, in, the, in the cheap seats although obviously they have power in terms of money putting their two cents worth in that doesn't at all work for what we're all going for so you do experience that no matter what level you're at no matter what level the actor is at no matter what the role is that somebody that has an opinion and if it doesn't, it often doesn't mesh with the general feeling of what we're going for. We're all on the same team, you know, but there is a pecking order for sure of who gets to, to, to choose, you know. Again, my only power is who I present. So you may not make the cut of being presented to the people who are in the power to, to hire you, but you will be presented as opposed to being someone that won't even get to come to the party. And that is my decision making. It's my taste my knowledge of who there is and my taste of who I think I feel is appropriate for something that I've been, that I've been chosen to cast, you know, but, um, but it's a different kind of take my take. You never know that you didn't make it to the, you know, <laughs> the final cut. You just know that you came in for me and it didn't work out. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's not this big horrible scene. That's, that's something that I really enjoyed. I watched a few documentaries um, following up on that casting by documentary. Um, and 
and ta- they talked about and it was specifically uh, a female a group of female casting directors um, some of the big names um, in casting currently and they talked about how uh, they asked the question um, what would you like actors to know about you when they walk in and they said that we're on your side we are a cheerleader for you we That's want so you to succeed to we, we want you to succeed. And, uh, you know, recently, a few actually a few episodes back, we talked to Gordon Adams from Big Fish Northwest, um, who recommended we talk to you. And uh, and and th- there might be some confusion about the difference between, like you mentioned, a casting agent. There's no such thing. But between an agent and a casting director, you're both advocates for the actors. But could you just kind of describe the difference there yeah. and, and how they maybe the two work together and complement each other on an actor's behalf? Sure. The casting director has the task of finding the right pieces for the puzzle. And how we do that is we know our actors. We send out a breakdown to the agencies that would be supplying us with possibilities. We already know who we like, but their job is to get us to see people. They are trying to advocate for the people that are on their roster, because if their people book, then they get a portion of the pros of what they make. Mm -hmm. I don't make any money from the actors. I'm paid a day rate or a week rate or whatever my deal is from the people who are generating the project. So I have no skin in the game other to make sure, other than to make sure that my director and the powers that be with my director are pleased with the possibilities, with, with the, the um, choices that they have. So we're in different situations. The actor wants to have an agent, the agent advocates for the actor. Once I allow an actor in my room and once I allow that actor's performance to be seen by my client, My job is just to make my client happy, and it doesn't matter to me, although I might have my favorites, God knows, who they choose, as long as they feel they have had, they have choices. So, but, but we still, I always say to my actors when I'm teaching them, I go, look, I am your advocate, just like you heard from other casting directors. If you look good, I look good, because I brought you in. So if they think that you're a genius, then I'm obviously a genius for knowing (laughs) about you. De facto, yeah. I want to be the genius that they always come to when they cast in the Northwest, because they know they're going to get the best of the best and they're going to get the best out of the actors. So my job is to make you look good. So I'm on your side, because if you look good, I look good. And it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would, you do have a reputation to uphold as far as your, uh, like you said, your tastes um, with the folks that you work, uh, work with the directors and the folks that are calling you in on projects. So that is important. Yeah. It's a totally different game though. The agents are there to supply casting directors with people to see, and then our job is to supply choices that make sense based on what we're told by the people generating the project and make them happy that they have choices. So, but I don't get paid by the actor. No money changes hands between an actor and a casting director unless it's in an educational situation. So I really, you know, I have skin in the game insofar so far as I want you to do well when you come into my room, but I want everyone to do well. And I'm there to, to make sure that if there's anything that I can add to the mix, that'll make you more comfortable, that'll make things more clear, that'll help you walk in and have confidence. I'm there. I'm, I'm there for it. I take it very seriously. My, my role in the room. Well, let's say Matt or I, or somebody that's listening to the show comes in your door for the first time to audition or try out for a part. What are the key do's or don'ts that you would get? Just one or two tips uh, for things you should avoid doing and things that you should do when you come in through your doors for the first time. Let's do the do's, okay? Let's just give the do's. The do's is, one. the first do is make sure you're prepared. There's no way you can come into an audition and do the best job you can do if it's all about the words because you're not prepared. So, but being prepared doesn't mean that you, that you know the, the vocabulary, the lines, the words. You make choices. We always want to see an actor come in to make choices. It's very hard for an actor to make choices because generally they don't see the whole picture, meaning they don't get the whole script. They're getting sides. They're given a two-line synopsis of what the storyline is. And then they're supposed to in- make interpretation and choices based on cryptic and vague information. That's, that's a tall order, <laughs> but that's what auditioning is. So come in, make your choices. You'll never be able to second guess what the director wants. So come in, be prepared, know the piece, make choices about the the piece, come in and play those choices and be prepared and poised to take direction. That's where I lose most of my actors. I can't imagine that they would come in unprepared. I mean, sometimes you get an actor comes in unprepared. Sometimes it's just a crappy day for them. Or sometimes they just, what can I say? They don't get the whole, the dynamic of what they're doing. But mostly it's when someone actually 
does or doesn't talk to them that they lose their stuff. Mm. <laughs> and it, seeing it happen hurts my heart. You know, where someone actually thinks they're interesting enough to try to give more information to maybe make the, have them adjust their choices and they kind of go somewhere we don't know where they go. And I always say to my students, Auditioning is the most unnatural thing you do as an actor because there's psychology there. You want the part, you want to please, you don't know exactly what they want because you're given very cryptic and vague information and you come into this room and sometimes it's a friendly room, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, sometimes my clients unfortunately are eating or going in and out or on the phone. I mean, there's it, it's chaos sometimes. And you have to be able to focus and come in and you have to love what you're doing and then show us what you can do and then be poised and ready to make an adjustment. That's the do's. The don'ts are just, don't mess up, you know, don't be sloppy, don't, you're a professional. Once you walk into a professional casting director's office, we're professionals, we're allowing you to show your professionalism, so be professional. And those are the qualities that I'm looking for. An actor comes in prepared, ready to make choices and poised and ready to take direction. That's it for me. That's all I care about. Really? And you have to be available. That's a big pet peeve that all casting directors will talk to you about. People come in for shows and they go, oh, but I'm going to be out of town for the shoot. Oh, well, I, uh, I, da, 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 I had child care issues. It's like, you shouldn't be here then because we don't want to have to deal with the, the, the no's, the, the negatives. Sometimes it comes up and it's unavoidable. Dates change. But in general, you know, you're coming in saying, I'm here to do whatever it takes to get this role. So it's about, you know, so the, the, I'll give you the one don't is, is don't, this is a double negative. Don't not be available. So right. be available. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now you do a lot of teaching. You're, you're an adjunct instructor at Cornish uh, and also the professional actors training program at UW. Do uh -huh. you offer private classes? I mean, acting is so frequently about auditioning. Do you offer private classes for local actors who'd like to improve their skills? Yes, I do. So I have a Saturday class that is open to everyone, every skill level, every background to students for one day intensive. And it's act, it's not acting technique, it's auditioning technique because right. my expertise is what happens in that room. Right. How to prepare you to walk into the room, how to prepare you to deal with what happens in the room, how to make sure that you're working on the piece the way it will sh sh make you shine with the piece or that you're working on. So that I have that class one Saturday a month. And then the PATP at UW and Cornish. Cornish, I do a quarter there. And PATP, every, uh, every few years, um, we do three days. Sometimes we do one, uh, depending upon the money. Everything with the universities are about money. But Cornish, every year I get their seniors, which are their fourth year students. The PATP is three year students. I usually, when I come in there, I'm usually with the third year students. So they're already, so all of these people are already trained actors. And now they want want to learn the specific skill, since it's a skill, of auditioning for the camera, which is a very specific kind of auditioning. Right. It's very specific. Everything, everything for the camera is very specific. So my, this is my milieu, you know, the specificity of auditioning for the camera and what skills you need to have to do that and make that, make yourself shine in that situation. Very specific. That's my expertise. If folks are interested in that Saturday class, uh, I, I assume it's happening via Zoom right now. Yeah, it is. But actually, it's working out. I'm shocked. Yeah. It, it, um, should they email you or is that available on your Facebook yeah, page? They should email. It is on my Facebook page, but I'm not a big Facebook person. I don't check it that often. I'm bad. I'm a dinosaur. So <laughs> you just have to email me. I'm very open to actors uh, contacting me to ask questions. And I have a flyer that's an information sheet, but it's Jody Rothfield at Gmail. So okay. just email me if you're curious about what's the class. I'll send you the flyer. You're interested in dates or you just want to talk to me about like where you should be training and if this is the class for you, maybe it's not. Uh, so there are all sorts of things that you might want to find out that I'm happy to help you navigate. Well, that's awesome. We'll post that information in our show notes. And uh, this has been a, quite an education, Jody. Uh, thank you so much <laughs> for your time tonight. My pleasure. Really, this is my pleasure because this is my community. So if there's any way that I can give them information and make them feel comfortable, it's good for me, you know? Well, I think a lot of us have wondered, you know, when you watch the credits on a, on a, at the end of a movie, what the role of the casting director is versus some of these other ones. And I uh, appreciate you shedding some light on that. It's uh, like Matt said, it's been super educational for me. So I, like everything else in, in film and when there are credits, it's all negotiated in your contract up front. So for instance, I did the CBS with my partner, Heidi, uh, the CBS series, um, The Fugitive with uh, Tim Daly. And that was like highest production values and CBS. And it was 
when they started to have HD and the hub was going to be in Seattle and it was a very big time. So we were able to negotiate a big credit. It's at the end because the LA casting director, of course, got a credit at the beginning. <laughs> we got it at the end, but it's called a clear card, which means it's just our name saying Seattle casting by and our names. Um, and so it's all negotiated. So when you see all those names, I think what you're really interested, not so much in what the casting, where the casting director's name is, but when the, you see all the names, producer, executive producer, co-producer, all the producers, very few of them are creative. Most of them are people who are in business who give money to the production. And so they get a credit as a producer, co-producer, and then there's the executive producer, maybe they have a little more hand in the creativity. Um, but that's all negotiated with the deal when you give your money as a producer or when you're hired as a casting director, you negotiate up front for where your name will be listed and how it will be listed on a single card or on a roll or it's kind of bullshit to be honest. <laughs> well, I'm always, I'm always amazed because I'm one of those guys that says I stay for every credit and try to read every oh, name. You're one um, of my guys. Yeah. <laughs> but I always, I always notice, I always think it's interesting <laughs> the people who get like the full screen treatment, you know, when yeah, you get yeah. no other name on the screen except that person, right, you know, and then you've got all the little, the, the other ones, all the, the, it's all negotiated. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all negotiated. And sometimes you have nowhere to negotiate because there are people who insist that you not share a card it's called a card that you're on the roll instead i mean i've had it i've had a card up front with my own name i've had a card at the end with my name and a partner's name and i've been on a roll <laughs> if it's, you know, and i've had they say well we're not going to give you know we can't we're not negotiating with you where your name will be listed it's like anyway but you know what as fun as it is to go to a movie and i also am one of the people who's anybody who works in in, in the industry is going to wait for the credits and we yes. hate people get up and they move in front of us but um as exciting as it is to see your name and it doesn't people when you go to the premiere every clap you know, it's exciting you're part of the you're part of the team it's it's very exhilarating but but more importantly it's just after a while it really i don't know i don't i don't really get as much of a i get a bang out of seeing my name but i don't really care where it is because i know the people that worked on the piece know about who worked and who did it and what mm -hmm. we did i feel more like as i get older that i don't need to toot my horn as much it's not that i don't love the credit i love the credit <laughs> and i'm always happy when i get bigger credit you know but i feel like um i don't know you get a different perspective as you do something for for a lot of years about you know first of all by the time you see it it's so long after you did it <laughs> that <laughs> oh that's right that I, I was in that <laughs> i was on that yeah, project to the next thing and then <laughs> that's not to say you don't want to see it and you don't want to negotiate for the placement it's called the placement on the card but i don't really have as much i, I don't feel like i care as much now you know i've seen people make i've negotiated for some things and I ended up getting something else that i didn't negotiate for better or worse sometimes worse you know so you never know. No, but that's what you're looking at. You, when you're seeing all the producers, I think that's what people are curious about. How could there be so many producers? What the hell did they do? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I look at the IT people and all because I, there's, there's, you know, being in IT and, and mm -hmm. with, especially with Disney, there's some that, hey, I might know that guy or, or something like that. But Family, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think I like it. I mean, there's a lot of names, but it just shows you how many people go yes. into making yes, of these course. films. It's Give huge some good community. context. Huge community. Yeah. And how many people were affected by COVID too? Because these are all a lot of people that are out of work. Oh God, mm -hmm. it's not funny. Yeah, yeah, no, people, a lot of unemployment, I'm sure. And 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 just just trying to help and turn people on to work when there is work because they haven't been working. And this is a small town, so we really are a community and you know when people aren't working. So if there's something you know that they could possibly get in on, you tell them. You know, we're working for each other, with each other. It's That's the great thing about a smaller town. There aren't thousands of us and we know who we are and you want to, you want your people to work and you want them to make a living so that they can stay here and we can all make a living. Well, I think this conversation will go a long way uh, for a lot of our listeners, uh, not only the background of casting, but also some great tips and hints and, and hopefully just grow that community because that's what Greg and I are all about. I'm for that. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. Jody, we'll have to get you back on and talk more. We probably talk for a few hours on this topic. This is a fun one. I had fun, so thank you guys. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you again to our guest, casting director Jody Rothfield. For more information on her casting classes, email her at jodyrothfield at gmail.com and linked in the show notes. Join us next week, Friday, March 26th, when we'll be joined by Danielle Barnum, an experienced and accomplished talent photographer from Seattle who will share her tips on how actors and artists can best use photography to promote themselves and their brand and how professional headshots can capture your style and character and enhance your portfolio. 
And remember, Heilman and Haver can now be heard every week. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. If you enjoy the show, make sure to follow us and share the podcast with a friend. We'd love to hear from you, so please join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter and email us with thoughts and comments at heilmanandhaver at gmail.com. And until the footlights come up again, thanks for supporting local theater and for joining us on Heilman and Haver.